OK, everyone, good evening. My name is Dr Sarah Marley and I am a senior lecturer in ecology here at Scotland's rural campus based in Aberdeen. Um, it is my pleasure tonight to talk to you about one of our programmes. So the wildlife and conservation management um, degree, we're going to be going through that and all the various levels and the content that it includes. Please do pop your questions in at the side and we'll do a wee Q&A uh, Q at the end and I can address any burning questions. So. With no further ado, um, introducing you to Scotland's Rural College. So SRUC is Scotland's national provider of college and university level education in the land based sector. And what this means is that we are a specialist institution. We want to be at the heart of developing a sustainable natural economy in Scotland. And that means educating folk like yourselves to be the future of that natural economy. So we want to address issues like environmental impact and sustainability because these are things that have an effect on all of our lives. So our courses try to directly address that by integrating science and real life expertise to tackle these wicked environmental challenges, both at a local scale and globally. And SRUC is a really special place. Obviously, I kind of have to say that because I work here, um, but it's more than just a, a college and it's actually more than just a single site. So we're scattered all across Scotland. We've got six main campuses that you can see in those little orange dots on the map on the screen here, but we also have a number of farms, consulting offices, vet practices and research centres all across the country. And this means that we're quite unique because we're bringing together not just education, but also research and consultancy. So we're going to have teaching teams that deliver high quality education to our students, but we also have a really active consultancy business and researchers conducting cutting edge science. And both of those are providing knowledge and innovation to our government, to policymakers, to businesses and to industry leaders. So as a student of SRUC, you get to be taught by this really interesting mixed team of people that covers all these different specialisms. You're going to have lecturers, instructors, researchers and consultants, as well as guest speakers from our extended networks who come in from industry to talk to you. And this means that knowledge exchange is really at the heart of what we do. We want to pass on all this subject specific expertise and ensure that you get to practically apply it all as a part of the learning experience. Uh, so the Aberdeen campus, out of all those little dots, Aberdeen is um, up in the northeast of Scotland and it's located on the Crabston estate, about five miles from the centre of Aberdeen city. So the pictures here are showing you the Ferguson building um, in quite good weather. I have to admit that wasn't the, the situation we had today on campus, but never mind. Sun can't always shine. But the Ferguson building has got a mix of teaching rooms. It's got its own library and importantly, a canteen. It's also where most of our teaching staff are based, um, not just the lecturers, but also student support facilities too. So help is always on hand whilst you're here doing your studies. The campus also has its own garden and an arboretum, a collection of trees from around the world. So it's perfect for grabbing some green time in between your classes. Um, so we have a whole mix of different uh, facilities and support and activities for students on campus too. So in the building we've got our teaching rooms, we have computer labs and the campus library and of course our arboretum, but we also have a mix of different staff available. Each cohort has a year tutor who is your go-to person throughout the year. So we hold regular group tutorials as well as one-to-one -one meetings each term to try and give you not just professional support but some personal support too because it can be quite a big change coming back into education. And so we're also the ones that you would go to if there's any instances requiring more specialised student support. Um, we've got a whole team of education officers and pastoral staff who are there to help you with study skills, managing your finances, balancing time commitments and also look after your well-being. Each campus also runs a range of student events, clubs and societies, and these are run by students for students. And the Aberdeen campus, I think, is particularly fortunate to be well placed near various forests, mountain bike trails and sports facilities. And of course, the northeast of Scotland itself has many fine features that we make use of for our field trips. So the tagline for Aberdeenshire is from mountain to sea, the very best of Scotland. And we definitely make the most of that. We've got national parks, special sites of scientific interest, nature reserves, special areas of protection, 
and of conservation. Basically, a lot of really highly prized natural sites that cover terrestrial, freshwater and marine ecosystems. And this means we've got a whole suite of habitats right here on our doorstep. Everything from upland moorland and forests to lower lying grassland and river catchments, right out to the coastal cliffs, estuaries and beaches. There's a whole lot to explore and we try to incorporate as much of that into our course as possible, no matter what the weather is, you'll see from some of these photos. So our wildlife and conservation management program is aimed at people who are interested in exploring all of these habitats and the species living within them. Good management of the land and countryside is really key for both conserving wildlife, but also for ensuring sustainable human activities. And so this course is aimed at people who are interested in the natural environment, who want to look after it and go on to also inspire others to do the same thing. What you can see here is a word cloud based on prospectus entries for the WCM courses. And you can see some really recurring themes throughout our programme, obviously wildlife conservation and management, but also topics like biodiversity, ecology, environment and people, because we can't change the world without also thinking how we're going to integrate people into that. And so all these topics are really strongly integrated all throughout our course, no matter what level you choose to study. And one of the great benefits of our programme structure is that you can sign up for one year, two years, three years or stay for the whole four. It's not a case of signing up for a course and having to stay the full four years until you get a qualification. At the end of each level, you can walk away with a little piece of paper that says you are qualified and you are experienced. We've got exit points at each level. And it's funny, we have quite a lot of people who sign up going, oh, I'm not the kind of person that can complete a whole degree. I'll just do my HNC. But then it's funny how many of them at the end of that year go, oh, that was actually OK. I did quite well. I'll just do one more year and then just one more year after that. And before they know it, they've gone from can't to can and then they're graduating with a full blown honours degree. So at the end of each year, you'll have a meeting with your year tutor and you'll discuss if you want to progress or not. This sounds very official, but so long as you have passed all the modules, you're going to have the option to go forwards. There's no application program process. Once you're in, you're in. And I often get a lot of questions in these sessions about what the difference is between a BSc and a BSc honours. So that fourth year that you do is really focused on research. It includes an independent research project that is designed, conducted, analysed and written up by you on a topic of your choosing. It's your chance to become a specialist in your own chosen subject. I think it's really a real crowning jewel of your undergraduate experience. Experience. But regardless of which um, level you want to stay to, Eve each year runs along five main themes. This is a science degree, but it's also one that incorporates social aspects, because like I say, you can't change the world without also having to change people. The environment needs managing for wildlife, but also for humanity. So a good proportion of the course is also looking at different ways to work with people, to educate them about the natural world and also how to manage that land sustainably going forwards. But the main core of what we do is the science of the wildlife and the habitats. What do they need and how do we conserve them? So throughout the course, we'll look at the underlying ecology of how species interact with each other, as well as with their wider environment. We assess the state of the natural world and then we look for ways to improve it in terms of biodiversity and habitat quality. So here are some example modules at different levels throughout the course. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. It's just an idea about the kind of things on offer. So in first year, this is all about setting the scene, getting everyone on the same level and giving you knowledge of this subject, getting a really strong foundation. We cover wide ranging topics like how ecology and geology can um, help us to understand the interaction between land, habitats and species. But we also train you in fundamental skills linked to species identification, practical conservation activities, how to use different range of tools, um, leadership skills and also how to best manage both people and wildlife. 
Second year then is all about applying that knowledge and skills. How does it all work and what does it all mean? We start to specialise a little bit more with modules specifically focusing on terrestrial, freshwater and marine ecology. We give you specialist training and ecological surveying using software like GIS for mapping habitats and species distributions. And we also teach you how to work with different stakeholders and the broader community to manage habitats and species successfully. Third and fourth year is your chance to really grow as independent scientists and evaluate the subject. What aspects of conservation do you think are working and which bits are not working and then how can we improve them? This is the chance to really apply your knowledge to different management challenges to achieve conservation impact. And to do this, we train you in a variety of field analysis and research skills. So who are the people delivering this, this teaching experience? Um, there's six core members of the teaching team. But as I say, there's also guest speakers coming in from industry and various other faces that will float past you if you stay the full four years. Um, to give you a quick run through of them, starting with Louise Ross, she is the leader of our program um, at all levels in the undergraduate. So everything from HNC up to the bachelor's honours degree. Louise specialises in plant ecology and upland management. Colin Hardacre is our longest serving member of staff. He's an expert in GIS, in forestry and in visitor management. Um, Helen Anderson, she works in terrestrial ecology. So she's really interested in plant herbivore interactions and she also does work on seabirds and invasive species. Dave Knight is our sustainability guru and focuses a lot on environmental management. Nick Littlewood is a self-professed wildlife geek. He's into all aspects of wildlife and habitats, but he does particularly specialise in birds, bats and bugs. If you're interested in any of those, and Nick will happily talk to you about them more. And then, of course, there's me. Um, I'm the resident marine biologist, but I'm also responsible for doing all the statistics and data teaching, which sounds not so fun. I promise there's lots of whales in it. We do make it enjoyable. But at SRUC, as you've maybe guessed by now, learning's not confined just to the classroom. You're not just sitting there listening to endless lectures from us. We have study tours, field trips, and lots of real life case studies that feature throughout our whole course. So in the pictures I've got here, the person standing in front of the group isn't actually a lecturer. They're site managers, they're practitioners, guest speakers. We want you to have links with real world people and projects because this leads to not just great your knowledge and understanding, but also it gives you opportunities to network, to find out about volunteering opportunities, how to get work experience and even jobs at the end of it. We really want to bring that real life expertise and research into your sphere of education. Uh, and this is when I've got a, a short video just to show you some of the adventures that we've been having with our students over the last year or so.
as the video says, we really do get out and about regardless of the weather. I don't think I noticed before how many snacks we also seem to consume because a lot of those pictures were all us eating ice cream or, <laughs> or sitting having picnics in really nice locations. But certainly compared to other universities I've worked at where you have maybe one field trip a year, we get out a lot and we like to give you that practical first hand experience. As well as the teaching, though, um, and your formal education, there's also additional opportunities too. For example, we've got the Rural Skills Club and Wild Time Society that are all about getting you out, giving you more practical skills, getting you involved with local projects. So um, here's some photos, for example, the Rural Skills Club sowing their own wildflower meadow out the back of the Crabeston estate. Um, but they've also been out to do things like wild camping, wild swimming and all kinds of adventures that I probably don't really want to know about as the lecturer. And then at the end of it, you get to go to graduation. Um, so no matter what level you're leaving at, you do have a little graduation ceremony. And this is currently happening down in Butte Hall in Glasgow. So our degrees at SRUC are currently underwritten by the University of Glasgow, although we are being assessed for the provision of degree awarding powers. So stay tuned on that. But regardless at the end of your time with us, whether it is an HNC or a full blown honours degree, you have the opportunity to attend a graduation ceremony and really celebrate your achievement with your lecturers, your, your peers in the class and also your family and friends. And then it's out into the real world and we've got an excellent graduate employment rate with our graduates finding roles, a wide range of different research institutes, NGOs, charities, government departments and industry bodies. So to summarise, why choose us? Hopefully you've got a sense of just how passionate we are about providing you with real life opportunities to learn, apply your knowledge and realise your potential. And we do this by getting you out and about as much as possible, delivering practical skills alongside the theory and introducing you to our wide professional networks. And one thing I will say is that I've worked at several universities around the world and SRUC has by far the highest level of student support I've ever seen. We know our students and we genuinely want you to succeed. We will set you up for success. And this course in particular is important because we need to protect and care about our natural resources. Human activities are expanding across the world at unprecedented rates. We're changing the environment, we're threatening species and people everywhere are increasingly recognising this. And in fact, the United Nations recently launched decades of ecosystem restoration and ocean sustainability to try and focus public attention on these key issues. And so an aspect of this is managing both people and nature together. You can see this in the pictures with some local examples of conservation needs and concerns we've got around the northeast of Scotland. But we want to try and train the next generation of scientists to help solve these wicked problems and continue this vital conservation work, not just in Aberdeen, not just in Scotland, but at a global level. So if this sounds like something you want to be part of, then walk this way. And with that, if we've got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, Sarah. That was really interesting. Yeah, we've got quite a number of questions have come through. Um, I oh think gosh. some of them, yeah, I know, <laughs> I think some of them you might have already covered, but I'll just run through them as they're, they're coming in. Brilliant, um, thanks. So the first one we've got is, do you get many applications from outside of Scotland? We don't get that many applications from outside of Scotland, but let me think who we've had in the last couple of years. We've had applications certainly from across Europe. Um, we've got some students from over in North America that have studied with us as well. So it does happen. We do have some, some international students on our course. The next question says, how many students are in the average class size for this course? So it definitely changes across the levels. I'd say in first year, that tends to be our biggest intake year with people doing HNCs and then kind of filters down a bit over time. So let me see. We started with we had 20 students, I think, in our first year class this year, and we've currently got 10 students in our honours year. Do you offer support for disabled students? Yeah, so we've had students with a variety of different disabilities and support needs joining the course. Um, if it's something you're particularly worried about, then definitely get in touch with us and we can chat things through and make sure that whatever your situation is, we can figure out a way to work on it together and get you the experience that you want. Are some aspects of the course practical? 
definitely there were definitely practical components to this um there's obviously like theoretical bits there's going to be knowledge gathering you're going to have lectures you're going to have readings to do but like i say we are keen to get you out and about we want to get your hands dirty we want you to really be able to do conservation first hand um, so that might be through something as simple as um, a site to visit and just kind of looking around. It might be doing some actual conservation work. Um, so in the video there, you saw some students using a, a terrifying amount of tools and hold, holding up their proud bird boxes at the end of it. Um, there's lots of opportunities like that. How are we assessed throughout our course? That's a really good question. Um, so there are a range of different assessments. We really believe in having assessments that are authentic and by that I mean that they're you know it's not just an essay it's not just a, a written report it's not just an exam we're definitely trying to move away from exams at the moment we want you to do something that is a useful assessment that teaches you something as well so for example we have student assessments that are based on posters or on presentations so that you can develop those kind of communication skills. We've got assessments that are podcasts or they're developing your own website. Um, we have field based reports where you go and collect data and analyze it and write it up as a group or individually. Um, we do all kinds of different assessments. Um, they tend, the HNC and HND levels are pass fail for the majority of assessments. And then as you move up into third and fourth year, they start to be graded. Is there anything I can do if I don't meet the grade requirements? Get in touch. We are happy to discuss your situation. I think there is much more to life than a grade um, and that doesn't necessarily capture all of your experience or your dedication to the subject. Um, if you haven't got the grades, it might be that we have a look and we go, OK, well, you know what? You've got all this experience. You're obviously a very committed student where we're willing for you to come join the course or we can suggest ways that you can get that experience. So you can come back to us um, in a year's time, for instance, and be in a stronger position to apply. Grades are not the end of the world. Are our theory sessions lectures or interactive lessons? <laughs> um, so we follow a curriculum called Seedable, which means that we are really interested in doing active and blended learning. And by that, it means we don't believe that, you know, classes should be um, just one voice. Um, we think it's much better that it's applied learning, that you're going to have the chance to put that knowledge into context. You're going to have the chance to do what we call a flipped classroom where you generate the knowledge yourself. We will have some lectures, particularly for instance, guest speakers where they come in to share their expertise, but we try to have very interactive classes. Um, the next question says, will there be an in-person open day or applicant day? Caroline, you might be better placed to answer that one. You've got the knowledge of the dates that don't stay in my head. I have, but I haven't got my diary to hand. But <laughs> what I'll do, what I'll do is um, when I when I send um, a link to this recording, um, I'll include details um, about our open day. And yes, we do have applicant days. Um, so once you've applied, um, you will hear more information about those. We don't we don't release those publicly, but you will you will get an invitation to an applicant day. We basically hold kind of VIP sessions. If you've applied and you're keen to come, you get to come do a little um, explore the campus and we put on some events and things like that just for the VIPs who have actually applied. Oh, the next one's interesting. Is there a clothing guideline we should follow whilst on campus? Um, definitely wear some. That's a great start. Um, <laughs> there's not a uniform or anything like that. That's not how we roll. You are here as adults, as independent learners. And we obviously expect you to, to dress respect to, respectfully, um, but it's there's not a uniform or anything like that. Do we need any PPE or equipment for practical sessions? Um, so some things, for example, wellies will, will do you really well for going out and about in all of our different habitats. Um, for instance, we've had student trips out to bogs, um, out onto the rocky shore, stuff like that, which is, goes a bit bit wetter than your, your typical hiking boots. Um, but otherwise, if it's a specific piece of PPE or equipment, then we will provide it. Do you have an example timetable so we can see how long each lesson is and where the breaks are? 
Um, no, not off the top of my head, but I can give you a rough illustration. Um, so for example, we typically break our sessions down into morning and afternoon classes. Um, so for instance, you might be in on a Monday morning for from 9.30 to 12.30 to do one particular unit. We would try to then get you in on the afternoon as well so that you know, you're coming in for a full day on campus wherever possible. But sometimes it might just be a half day. It might be a morning, it might be an afternoon. Um, and it depends what level you're coming in at as well for how much time you're gonna be spending on campus compared to doing your own independent learning. Are we required to do a work experience placement alongside our course? No, you are not required, but if you want to do one, we will try our best to support you. Um, so, for instance, we are often sending round uh, volunteering opportunities or internships or seasonal jobs that come in because we've got a wide network. Um, last week I was sending some jobs around the students that were for um, different seasonal ranger jobs in different nature reserves around the northeast of Scotland um, because I work with the reserve manager and they know that we can tap into some really good hands on practical students. So you don't need to do it. It's not a requisite of the course, but if it's something you're keen on doing, we are happy to support you doing that and point you in the right direction. I think it's a good idea. I think it's really nice to be able to do that kind of thing to almost try before you buy, before you kind of go into this lifelong career. There are so many different aspects to wildlife and conservation management. You saw the list of jobs I put up, the different um, people you can work with, the different places you can work. And so it's hard to know that when you're still learning about it. Whereas if you can go and do, you know, a two month internship with Nature Scott, and then you can go and volunteer with the RSPB a bit, and then you can go try doing some visitor management on a nature reserve, and you find out which bit works for you. Where's your niche in all of this? And it's actually really satisfying to be able to help students find that and find where they fit into things. That's great. Thanks, Sarah. The next question is, do you offer a master's course to follow on from this one? Uh, yes, we do. So I've presented to you tonight the undergraduate uh, options. We do also have postgraduate study. So we've currently got a distance learning master's, which is done over three years. Again, you can leave at different points throughout the year. You can leave after year one with a postgraduate certificate, a PG cert. You can leave after year two with a postgraduate diploma, a PG dip, or you can say the full three years for your master's course. There is actually an open night tomorrow if, online again with myself. If you would like to learn more about the, the master's programme, so you can check out our website website I'm sure for details on that. We are also currently in the process of developing some new master's programmes but that's a bit hush hush you'll have to stay tuned for that one. Um, oh no this is a two-parter so oh. I'm interested <laughs> I'm interested in the distance learning option am I right in thinking you can do it part-time or full-time? Oh, sorry, I was waiting for the second part. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, I was braced. Um, so the distance learning HNC, I assume you're referring to there, Anna. So that is a part time course. You can't do distance learning as a full time option. So the distance learning HNC, it's it's spread over two years, whereas our on campus HNC is one year because that is full time. Can you please tell us more about how the course is structured and lecture times, etc. Mm. All the details really important to know at this stage and um, balancing it around a young family. Yeah, and that's why so many people like to do our part time way of doing the distance learning, right? So I teach into that um, course as well. And how we typically run it is all those lists of modules that I showed you, you, you have them spread out over the two years. So it's our, our academic year is broken down into three terms, so you'll be doing six terms in total and each term you're going to be doing, I think it's two, two units. Um, those typically involve an element of independent directed study. So, for example, the lectures will be pre-recorded. You'll watch some videos of the lecturer online. You'll do some directed reading. You'll go to some different resources, materials that we put up onto our Moodle page, which is our virtual learning environment. And then those will be supplemented with regular live online sessions. These are typically in the evening, like from 7 to 8 p.m., a one hour slot. And they're there to really support 
the, the, the knowledge. So, for example, when I'm running my unit, I do biodiversity conservation on the distance learning course. I will pre-record my lectures, expect students to watch that lecture in their own time. I release them well ahead. People have got plenty of time to watch them whenever they want. And then I'll once a week have this one hour live session. It's optional, you don't have to come, but people seem to enjoy it. It's nice to meet the other people on your course as well and really go through this process of learning together. And I try to facilitate that by putting people into say online, online, blah, blah, online breakout rooms and then giving you a task to do that backs up the learning. So for instance, we were learning about different strategies of increasing biodiversity on farmland and woodlands the other week. And so I put people into breakout rooms and gave them the task of designing their own farm that had all of these different aspects of biodiversity enhancement. And where would they put it? What species is it going to be benefiting? How would they still balance the farm management around that um, to see if that could work? Similarly, when we're learning about different conservation organisations, we'll give them the task of doing research into one particular organization and presenting it back to the class online. We do have guest speakers that come in in our evening sessions too, so you still get that industry um, relationship building aspect as well. But get in touch, Anna, if we're more than happy to give you a bit more detail, you know, on how what might work best for you in your situation. Great, thanks, Sarah. The next one says, will my exam arrangements from college carry across automatically or does it work on a case by case basis? So I'm assuming, Sophie, this isn't a kind of student support situation. So if you, for instance, um, normally get extra time in your exam for an educational support need, uh, say that you're dyslexic or something like that, and you need a bit more time, um, then that also applies here. However, you do need to make us aware of that. It won't just automatically kind of feed through the system. Um, there's room on your application form where you can let us know about this. Once you're enrolled, you can also have a meeting with one of our academic support tutors. So they are all about educational support and learning and they can help you with this. Similarly, if you think you fall into one of those categories, but you've never been sure, maybe you're coming back to education, you always think, you know, maybe I am dyslexic, maybe I do have ADHD. I'm not really sure we can help with that. Once you're enrolled, we can get you through that assessment process, help you up with some disability support um, and see what extra um, requirements you might have that can best support your learning. But like I say, get in touch if you want to be sure about your situation. Um, the next question said, is there any material you'd recommend reading to prepare for the course or anything else you'd recommend for us to do? Bring your enthusiasm. That's all I can tell you to do. Don't worry about pre-reading. That's kind of why we're here, right? This is in the first year in particular is to get you all up on the same speed. If you were wanting to come into the course at a different level, say you want a direct entry to second year because you've studied elsewhere somewhere before, something like that, then yeah, there might be a few things we could point in the right direction just to make sure you're on the same level as everyone else. But that would be a case by case basis. Otherwise, sit back, relax, brace for some excitement and just you'll be all right. <laughs> That's good advice. Um, <laughs> Always good advice. Sit back, relax, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, do you offer any trips over the course, national or international? Are these optional or mandatory? Uh, we do a lot of trips. So there's a lot of one day trips that will just go out um, that are kind of built into the course from some, you know, go somewhere around Aberdeen campus, um, go up into um, the Dinnet Nature Reserve, have a trip up to the Cairngorms, go up to Balmedi to do some dune surveys, something like that. Um, but then we also have residential field trips for some of our units too, particularly as you get on into the higher levels. For example, I run the fourth year marine course and we're going to be doing a one week intensive marine field trip. We'll head over to the west coast of Scotland. We'll be doing some rocky shore surveys, marine mammal surveys, seabird surveys, all the really kind of hands on stuff that we're going to make the most of while we are over there and do some of our own research projects. At the moment, we don't have any international trips going, but I know that there is, I think there was the an Africa trip that happened last year, which I'm not entirely across now. I'm just kind of babbling at this point. There was an Africa trip last year that and that was an optional, you know, sign up, pay extra fundraise to go type trip. So there's a few different options available. Um, 
build trips sometimes will link into assessments so i guess in that way some of them can be mandatory but then others are optional if it's something you're worried about for your particular situation say young family you're worried about getting um the opportunity to, to go away you can't leave them alone or if you've got work commitments or um, something about your personal circumstances get in touch we're very friendly we're happy to chat through that's good advice too. Uh, the next question. All of it tonight, good grief. <laughs> um, is geography involved? So we don't have a dedicated geography module or anything like that. We do have a module on um, geology and geomorphology. I have to think about that. It's not my specialist subject. It's rocks, um, but some people are really into that. That's fine. They're not dolphins, but I get it. Um, and so there's a unit dedicated to that, and that's all about, you know, how our habitats have formed so we can have an understanding of the underlying structure of them because it's not just about you know protecting trees we also have to protect geological features um, but other than that we've also got gis courses which are geographic information um, software type courses and they're all about how to study the landscape how to map it how to plot the movements of animals how to map out different habitats and that kind of plays into geography as well what we try to do is called a holistic approach. That means we're not just go putting things into different categories of, you know, in school, you're like, you either study biology or physics or chemistry. That's not how we roll. We've got wildlife and habitat and people, but those are three things that underpin everything. You can't do one without any of the others. Wildlife depends on habitats. Habitats are used by wildlife and used by people. People are relying on habitats and wildlife. There's this whole big interconnected web of things in the natural world. Um, and so that's how this course is delivered, covering all those bases. Um, the next question says, can you tell us about the weekends that you attend for the distance mm -hmm. learning course and when they norm and when they normally are throughout the year? So with the distance learning course, we have what we call study weekends. Obviously, most of this is done remotely, um, but we try to have some optional weekends where people can come along, get some hands on experience, meet us in real life, meet each other in real life and basically go on a bit of a jolly and have a bit of an adventure. Um, so we normally have one of those in our welcome week each year, so like the first induction week when you're back on campus at the start of the new academic year. And then we have one or two others throughout the course of the year, like one in the autumn, one in the spring kind of thing. They go to different places around Scotland, sometimes on one of our Elmwood campuses, but mostly at the Aberdeen campus. That's great. Um, do students get to join Aberdeen University clubs and societies? I don't actually know. I know that there's a discounted membership to the Aberdeen Sports Village. I know you can use the library. I think you can join the clubs and societies, but don't quote me on that. So Caroline, I think it's a, we need to make a note. We'll have to check that one. Yeah, and we do have our own um, student association as well. So mm. what I'll do, I'll, I'll include some information in the email that I send, Perfect, send out with the link. Okay. Um, how do you manage dyslexia? It's a very individual thing, right? I mean, dyslexia is kind of an umbrella term and yet people have so many different experiences with it, so many different requirements. Um, so some of the things we might do, for instance, is making sure that our lecture material is available ahead of time so people can read it at their own pace. It's not a case of like, right, read this in five minutes. Whoa, calm down, um, giving you that kind of build up time. If there are any exams or tests, it's putting some additional time onto that. So you've got what the time that you need um, for you know, written coursework that you're going to be submitting, you can work closely with our education support tutors. They can have one to one meetings with you. They can target any areas that you're, wor you're worried about. They can help explain the assessment instructions if you're not quite clear on them and check that your answers are ticking all the boxes um, and do some read through and help with proofreading. But very individual, again, get in touch if you're worried. And once you enroll, then we can set up those meetings so you can hit the ground running. Great. Um, the next question says, are you planning on offering the HND via distance learning in the future? It's mm -hmm. a shame that you can't go all the way through SIUC due to this gap. It is a shame. You're absolutely right. Send us an email about it to, and we'll see if we can mount a case if we get enough interest. At the moment, it's not something that's on a horizon. We're currently developing some new master's programmes, but it's not to say that in the future it's 
not. But we can only respond to that need if we know it exists. So send Caroline lots of emails about it for her to pass on to our boss. <laughs> Um, the next question, how does accommodation work? So accommodation is shared with the University of Aberdeen. They've got halls of residence, Hill Head Halls, uh, which is down kind of towards the beachfront in Aberdeen um, near Seaton Park. And they've got a whole mix of different types of, of student flats and accommodation in there. So on your application, you can also, I think, put in an interest in student accommodation, but that's where you'd be based on that. In the past, we've had students based at Hillhead and then they've met other people in their class and in year two, they've moved out and moved in with them and got their own flat together once they, they've had the, ch the chance to choose their own housemates rather than being allocated to them. Um, the next few we've got are distance learning. I think we have mm -hmm. maybe covered these already. Um, can I ask how the distance learning is delivered? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I think we covered this a little bit already, but and it's going to be a mix. It's going to depend on different lectures, but it's typically a combination of kind of pre-recorded videos, lectures, materials and those live sessions that happen once or, or twice a week to cover different units. And it, those live sessions will give you a chance to have Q&A with the lecturers, to interact with your peers, to meet guest speakers, to do some actual activities. We can still do practical activities over distance. They're obviously just going to be a little bit different. I think that's what the, the next question is asking mm. as well. Yep, that mm. covers that too. I'll, I'll just add on to that one as well, because um, this one is worried about um, viewing them. Yes, most of those are recorded. So the way that I do it is I will record the chat that's from me, you know, the official chat. Of, of me giving a summary of the, the topic that week or setting instructions for the activity. What I what I don't record is people's discussions amongst the students. I feel like that would kind of you know be a little bit unsettling if you know your discussion is being recorded, and also it's very technologically tricky to do when everyone's in a different breakout room. So what I get students to do, for example, is contribute to a shared document throughout the activity, and then we make that document available afterwards, or we make some of the outputs or some of the notes from the discussion available. So you're still getting that. You can always watch the recording of of me. Um, doing my bit at the start of the live session, but generally not the kind of really practical bits. Um, another distance learning question. I am looking at the distance learning postgraduate. Mm -hmm. Could you expand on the differences from what has been covered for the BSc? Yeah, so for the, the master's level over distance, like I say, we had it in across three years, first year PG cert, then PG dip in year two, then full blown masters in year three. Years one and two are taught years, so you have uh, four modules in each year. It's then broken into two semesters each year instead of terms. So you'd have two modules between summer and Christmas, another two modules between Christmas and the next summer, um, and then the same in year two. Those are delivered also with a mix of kind of pre-recorded lectures and things as well as live sessions to go along with it. We also have the study weekends where you'll meet up with us a couple of times a year, optionally, but you're welcome to come along. It's some practical experience, have some field trips. Um, what and then in the final year of the masters is when you it's not so much taught, there's a little bit of teaching, but it's mostly focused on your independent research project. When you're doing your actual master's dissertation on a project of your choosing, you have a supervisor you work closely with. You still have some group sessions for things like how to write your thesis, how to do data analysis, things like that. But it's much more independent working. How it differs from a BSc to a master's, in my opinion, is all about independence. You're doing your bachelor's um, degree, you graduate with your honours degree, that's your first taste of independent research projects, um, of managing a project, deciding what the work plan is going to be, how are you going to achieve this, how are you going to collect the data, how are you going to analyse it, what does it all mean, what recommendations can you make from it. Um, whereas when you kind of level up into the masters it's kind of just yeah, taking that to the next level. If I was hiring someone with a BSc compared to hiring someone with a master's, I would expect the person with a master's to have a much greater degree of independence. I'd expect them to have a deeper knowledge of their specialist subject. Um, I'd expect their skill sets to be just be slightly more honed. So it kind of depends where you're wanting to go. It depends what your past experience is already. In the master's programme, we have people who've never done anything 
biological or wildlifey before. Maybe they're coming from English literature or criminology or something random like this. No, accounting, who knows? And they just want to do a career change. They've already know how to study. They know how to write essays. They know how to do their you know kind of research bits, but they don't know this subject. And so in that case, kind of going over into the masters makes sense for you. For the undergraduate programme, maybe this isn't when you haven't done as much study before. Maybe you got some relevant wildlife or conservation experience, but you haven't done it in an academic setting. And so you do just need that little bit more guidance when it comes to preparing assessments, doing statistics, um, doing literature reviews, things like that. It's not just about you know the subject matter, it's about the study skills that goes along with it. If you're unsure which level works for you, get in touch. We're happy to talk it through. It's all good. Great, thanks Sarah. Um, there's a question here about is there any funding support for study trips abroad? No, because we don't really do many of them and the study trips abroad are an optional fundraise yourself type thing if and when they happen. Okay, um, quite a technical question here. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this one. It says, um, I saw on your website that laptops are available to borrow if you don't have one. Are you able to borrow one if you are a distance learning student? I'm closer to Oatridge, so I'm considering going there, but I don't think I can make it work with school hours. Yeah, so unfortunately not. So the laptops we have, they're available in the library, but they are only available to borrow during campus hours. So that also means you couldn't borrow them over the weekend or across um, an evening, anything like that. If you're close to Oatridge, you could obviously go there during kind of school hours, as it were, um, sit in the library, borrow, borrow a laptop, but that wouldn't help you in the evenings and weekends aspect. Um, if you are like, receiving any kind of disability allowance, then there might be some room there to get you equipment that you need. But otherwise, I'm afraid it's not something that we support. Um, the next question says, who should we get in touch with to ask more questions, specifically personal ones about disabilities, any issues or worries that arise, stuff like that. Well, I, I can include um, mm. a link to the, the email for the, the student support email and um, for the Aberdeen campus I think that's probably the the yeah. sort of the first step and they'll be able to get in touch with you by email or if you want to leave a phone number sometimes it's easier to talk things over um as well so yeah I will I will include that in my email perfect thanks Caroline and the next question will we get more information about the transport from Aberdeen to campus? I saw it's on the website. Do they charge a fare? Is it students only? Do they run throughout the day? OK, so we've got a, a bus that runs from Aberdeen City. It goes from Hillhead, Halls of Residence. It goes through the kind of city centre of Aberdeen and it comes out to campus. Um, it does not charge a fare. It is for SRUC staff and students only. Um, it doesn't run kind of continuously. It's very kind of set times because it's actually there to mostly support our NC students. Um, so they are kind of in for nine o'clock. They are leaving at 4.30ish. Um, I think there might be one around lunchtime as well. So it's very kind of staggered particular bits through the day. The okay. timetables do change on that as well, though. So um, I'm not sure I mean, we can provide you some information, I guess, but it doesn't mean it will be the same information come September. And the final question, I think, is when do you choose modules? Right. So in first and second year, HNC, HND, those units, modules, they're all set. There is not optional ones in that. When you progress up to your third and fourth year, that's when there are optional modules. So we will typically hold an information session ahead of that. Um, if you're joining us at that level, then let us know and we can include you because we we mostly run it for our, our currently on campus students. And um, we give an overview of these are the modules that are available. Um, these we try to get our students in that year at the moment to come along and speak about their experiences. So we're planning to currently run it for our third and fourth years. Let me think at the end of March. Gosh, March is next week. How did that happen? Um, end of March, we're going to be running a session on campus where our current third and fourth years come along and they will give advice to the second years moving up to third year. Um, the current third years moving up to fourth year will then also get advice from the fourth years. Then there'll be talks by us and things to help choose those modules too. 
That's great. Um, and I've, oh, there's another one come through just asking about examples of timetables. Um, so for distance the distance learning, learning it's typically two evenings a week um, at most, I would say. Um, so this term, it is on a Monday and Wednesday night from seven to eight each time. Um, but that changes each term because it's different teaching staff each term with all the different responsibilities and whatnot. However, you will be that information will be more available kind of come August, I would say, when we've got a clearer idea of what the timetable is going to be for next year. That's great. And that's the end of our questions now. So thank you so much <laughs> if you've got in touch. <laughs> you've kept us really busy tonight. It's been good. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we close um, this evening's event? The thing I would say, I mean, I feel there's a bit of an undercurrent of anxiety in, in some of these questions just about, oh, is this going to suit me? Does this meet my personal situation in terms of my work commitments, my family commitments, my own personal commitments and the needs that I have as a learner? Don't worry about it. We have seen thousands of students come through our doors. The teaching team as a collection have been doing this for quite a while. Um, we are flexible. We want to set our students up for success. We want you to achieve your best. There are plenty of learning enhancements and adjustments that can be put into place. All we need is clear communication about that. So get in touch. Caroline will provide you all the relevant email addresses and whatnot. Shoot us a line, call us up for a chat. It's all good. Don't don't worry about it. We are here. <laughs>